Today's reading is Psalm number one. If you're using the church Bible, the reading will be found on page 383 of the Maroon Bible, page 405 of the Red Bible, and page 843 of the Large Print Bible. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This is the word of God for God's people. Now Psalm 1, it provides the blueprint for moral living. The psalm is more than just a word to the wise, it is a word to be wise. In action, in choices, in character, and in our lives. Psalm 1 is all about choices. Do we turn left? Do we turn right? Do we do wrong? Do we do right? Do we have faith in God or do we have faith just in ourselves? And like all choices, once we make this choice, we're usually all in. But the good news for us is that no matter how old we are, we can still change our mind, we can still change our choices. Psalm 1 encourages us to take the road less traveled. It's a command against traveling the wrong road. Unfortunately, I don't think there's too many people now in this world that are, are taking the other road, the right road. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked. Verse 1 gives us the path of the righteous. It's a life filled with joy, fruitfulness, love of, and relationship with God. Look at the words that the psalmist uses to describe the person who does not walk with the wicked. They are like trees planted by streams of water. This tree is a tree that gets all of its nutrients from the stream. It's so close that it's always near God's life-giving water. This tree never thirsts. Its roots go deep, and nothing can shake it, no matter what the trial is. This tree will grow tall and strong and be visible to all from a great distance. And the fruit of this tree will be bountiful. The fruit of this tree will nourish many people. Because this tree is near the stream of living water, its leaves will never wither, and this tree will provide comfort to many. This is what happens to us when we, when we take the, the right road, when we turn our life to God, that make Him the center of our life. We can be these things to all people. We can be housing. We can be fruitful. The second choice is the path that the sinners take. This path leads away from God, away from life-giving waters, and, and into dry, arid lands. Those people are not like trees that grow near the stream. The path that the sinners take, it, it leads them to dry areas where they shrivel up and don't have life. They become like chaff, that dry stuff, where the good wheat falls to the threshing floor and the chaff just blows away. They can't withstand any trial. They're just blown with the wind. These people are, are like our confirmation students and our baptized babies I spoke of last week. These are the kids who, who have fallen away. Maybe they've fallen away because we didn't watch over them. Maybe we didn't guide them. But no matter what the reason, we have to bring them back into the fold. We have to regraft them into the branch so that they can have the life-giving waters, so that they can grow we can't allow these branches, our confirmation students and our baptized babies to dry and wither away. Happy are those that do not follow the path of the wicked, for they will stand like deeply rooted trees, and God will rejoice in their stature. That's you guys. You guys are the tree that gets all the nutrients from the river. Happy are those that do not take the sinner's path, because they will rejoice in the fruit that they have yielded in nurturing God's faithful. Once again, that's you guys. You have the, the message to give people that they need to live. Happy are those that do not sit with the mockers and say that God does not exist. 
During judgment, God will rejoice that his people have proclaimed his name in glory. Once again, that's you. You guys are the only ones that have the message. You guys are the only ones that have the knowledge that God exists. And you can tell that story to those that need to hear it. Psalm 1 is all about choices. The choice, though, is, is not whether to, to obey or disobey moral laws. It, it's more basic than that. It's the choice, do we make God the center of our life? Or do we keep ourselves the center of our life? When we're young, when we're babies, there's only one concern that we have. And that's, what is somebody going to do for me? Before we mature, all we can think of is, who's going to feed me? Who's going to change me? Who's going to rock me? Who's going to take care of me? It's all about us. But as we mature, as we become adults, we realize that there's got to be somebody else in our life. And most times there's this, just this big gaping hole, and we look to, to fill it with stuff. But no matter how much stuff we put in, no matter how much stuff we acquire or get, that hole is still there until we realize who can fill that hole. The choice given us by Psalm 1 is, is do we trust and live by God's word or do we place our faith in our own self-given word, the things that we create? God, Psalm 1 asks us, are we going to admit that we're created by a God or are we going to continue to create gods that we can worship? Psalm 1 tells us that, that the righteous are open to and dependent on a life with God. And the realization that God is God and that he reigns supreme. The righteous declare that Jesus is Lord over, over our entire lives, not just for an hour on Sunday. When we decide to follow God, we decide not to just worship him for this one hour. We're saying that we're going to worship him when we leave here. And we do that. We worship him by praising his name, by telling others what he's done for us. He doesn't just spend an hour with us. He spends our entire life with us. Psalm 1 tells us that, that unbelievers choose to follow a different way, living by their own wit, their own cunning, their own self-determination, being their own Lord and Master, not Jesus' Lord. The unbelievers are, are, are free to seek and secure their self-interests. They're their own judge, and they decide what's right or what's wrong. They make up the rules. To them, there's no right or there's no wrong. The only thing that exists is what makes me feel good, what makes me happy. And since they're the judge, they're always right. They're never in the wrong. Psalm 1 tells us that if we want to live a life fulfilled in service to God, we must do a little bit more. If we want to be that tall tree by the stream providing Christian nurture and fruit of the Spirit, we have to do more. We have to do what God asks us to do. We must delight in the law of the Lord. This means our joy must come from obeying every one of God's commandments and doing what the Bible tells us to do. Many choices in our early years, they're made for us. We don't decide to get baptized, but our parents decide that this is the right thing to do. Invite us into the family of God. But there comes a time when we have to start making our own choices to decide how much are we going to do for God? How closely are we going to follow his rules? How closely are we going to read scripture to find out what he's saying to us? When I was growing up, probably like a lot of you, we went to worship, we went to church on Sunday without even thinking about it. And if we didn't go, we thought we had to tell somebody about it. Not because they asked, but because we felt that something was missing. Nowadays, the people that don't go to church are in the majority. But there's a, another thing. When they ask us, why do we go to worship, that answer might be the difference between them staying away next week or attending worship. We need to ask ourselves, what is the reason that I come to worship? Why do I choose to get out of bed early on a Sunday morning or decide not to go fishing or decide not to go to the ball game and come to worship instead? Because that answer could mean the difference in someone coming. For me, the big difference is reading scripture. Because when I read what God has done for us, what he continues to do for me, I know I need to come here and worship him. 
because he has my best interest at heart. I don't go to church on Sunday anymore. I go to worship. And I worship him who saved me. When we read the Bible every day and we, we start to pray more, we start to have a personal relationship with God. And we start to understand why he created us. Verse 2 in Psalm 1 today tells us, Blessed is the one who meditates on his law day and night. The reward of meditating on God's word is our being formed by it, being transformed by it. We're forever changed when we finally dive into the word and meditate on it. The Bible, God's word, reveals that wholeness and fulfillment are found in trusting our life to our creator, our redeemer, our savior, and his spirit. Psalm 1 affirms our, our Christian conviction that in Christ, we learn the blessedness that comes from trying to be faithful to God's word as Jesus was faithful. Psalm 1 tells us that the Bible, the word of God, it's instruction for how we can turn away and turn towards him. And once we start reading the Bible on a daily basis, we start to find out what God has done for us. In Romans chapter 8, verse 25, Paul tells us that we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And the thing is, when we as believers look back on our life, we can see his hands and how he's guided us, how he saved us for, from stupid decisions that we've made. How he convinces us to turn one way instead of the other way. All I need to do is take that couple minutes and look back over our lives and we can see his hands. But the thing is, we also know that there's no guarantee that we're going to have a great life. We know that being as, as we are Christians, it's no guarantee that life's going to be easy. We know that because Jesus tells us. In John 16, 33, he tells us, I have told you these things, I told you the time's going to be rough, so that in me you may have peace. He tells us life isn't going to be easy, but we know that he's going to be there with us. Further in John, he tells us, in this world you will have trouble. He's given us a guarantee, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus is telling us that you're going to have trouble, but I'm going to be there with you. And don't worry, I conquered this world. I conquered death, and so will you. Last week, when, when I read John 15, verse 6, when I was talking about the confirmands, Jesus tells us, if you do not remain in me, you'll be like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Last week, I, I made the plea that we've got to go back out there. We've got to go get those confirmed kids, those babies who were baptized. Because in the Methodist church, when they're baptized, when they're confirmed, we promise that we're going to watch over them. We promise that by our example, by our teaching, we will guide them. They're not here because we didn't do something. We have to get them back connected so that they can get back into the branch and fed that living water. When we get our former members reconnected back in this church, Psalm 1, verse 3 tells us, That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. When we remain in God, when we get those kids connected back in, they will also Get that living water. When we do that, they'll have a never-ending supply of, of God's life-giving water. And we'll be like that tree planted by the water, nourished, growing, and sharing the fruits of the Spirit. <clears throat> our lives won't always be easy as Christians, but God will get us through our problems and our trials. When our roots are deep in God, we can't lose. It won't be easy, but we can't lose. But when our roots are just surface deep, any trial will blow us over. Without the promise of God being with us always, we don't stand a chance of surviving the trials that, that come upon us in this life. Is there anyone here who's lived a graced, a graced life where they never lost a parent, never lost a mother, never lost a father, never lost a job, never lost a house? Not one of us. We've all had some kind of trial. But because we're so deeply rooted in God, we can survive those things. 
I can't imagine what it's like to not believe in God and not have that promise that I'll not be able to see my mother or my father again. We have that promise. We need to tell others about that promise and tell them why we're here, why we worship the God we worship. When our roots are deep in God, we can take comfort in what the psalmist tells us in verse 6 because we know that it's true. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Our Lord watches over us always. Amen.